initial read. I've actually got a video on this, uh, Johanna, but it's quite, it's quite long. So, initial rate is, or are we talking about initial rate or any rate? Initial rate. Initial rate. Okay, all right, so initial rate, initial rate is all to do with this idea that when you, when you put, when you have enzymes mixed with substrate, yeah, as soon as you mix enzyme and substrate, some of the substrate starts to get converted to product, that's what enzymes do, so that after that instantaneous, in, after that instant where the enzyme and substrate were added, as soon as that, those two meet, substrate starts to be turned into product. And then what happens to the amount of available substrates there are for the enzyme? They decrease over time and eventually, as the time goes on in that reaction, eventually there is more product and less substrate and eventually only product is left okay so whenever you mix enzyme and substrate in a closed container where you're not providing continuous substrate this is going to be the situation and that's that's the situation in most of our enzyme controlled reactions what that means in terms of the result that we get so if we're measuring the product formation that's how we usually measure the rate, you know, the, the progress of a reaction is production, sorry, product, product formation. And on the x-axis, we will have time because we're, we're observing that reaction over time. Okay, so product formation, we're measuring or, or observing and recording here and time of the reaction here. So what's so the time where there was the highest likelihood of substrate and product um, substrate and enzyme colliding and and forming an enzyme substrate complex where when was that where was there the highest chance of an enzyme colliding with a substrate at the beginning okay so at the beginning the rate of the reaction is relatively high that's the highest rate that you were ever going to have at that concentration. One second later, when some of the substrate's been converted into product, what's the likelihood of an enzyme and substrate colliding with each other? Lower. And so what do you think has happened to the rate of the reaction? It's going to decrease. OK. One second later, it's going to decrease again. One second later, it's going to decrease again. It's going to decrease again. It's going to decrease again. It's going to decrease again until no more product can be made because at this point, what's happened? Yeah, no more reaction because all of the substrate has been converted into product. Okay, so that is what, then are you happy that that's, that's the reason why an enzyme substrate reaction curve looks the way it does, okay? So, f so that, that needs to make sense first of all. Then, then the argument is then that if I asked you for what the rate of this reaction was, you could say to me, well, there's lots of rates of reactions here. There's the rate of reaction at this point. There's the rate of the reaction at that point. There's the rate of the reaction at that point, that point, that point. So the standard which we use to compare the rate of reaction at a particular concentration is the initial rate. Okay, because that, that rate is changing all the time. So the only way that we can compare the different concentrations, if I wanted to compare what the rate of the reaction is at this concentration of substrate versus another concentration of substrate, or in the presence of an inhibitor and without an inhibitor, or at one pH versus another pH, the only standard that I have is the initial rate. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we do so first the first rule that we need to understand is that the rate of the reaction is equal to 
the slope of the line at any point. Okay, right? So I could, so if, let's just put some uh, times in here. So if that was one minute, that's two minutes, that's three minutes, that's four minutes, that's five, that's six, seven, eight, and nine. So I'm measuring time in minutes. So if I asked for the rate of the reaction at four minutes, I would have to work out the slope of the curve or the line at that point. Is that making sense? So what I would do is draw a tangent at time four minutes with my ruler, obviously. So I put the ruler to the line, make it touch the line at that point, draw a tangent, and then I would have to work out the slope of that line by drawing a triangle and then dividing the change the change in the y so the change in product formation according to that to the axis divided by the change in time or x yeah so what what you'd have to do is once once you've drawn the t uh, once you've drawn your triangle you use your ruler, not like how I'm doing it, but you use your ruler and say, right, if, if the edge of my, if the one point of my triangle is there, and the other point of my triangle is there, then it would have to be one, two, three point two minutes. Yeah, once you've drawn your triangle, it's fine. We're only interested in the slope. So you can draw your triangle this size, you could even have, I mean, as long as this line is still true, I could have drawn my triangle that size. Yeah, but because I'm working out the slope of the line, the size of the triangle won't affect that. It might affect how accurately I'm calculating it, but the slope of the line will still be true. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so I divide my change in y by my change in x, and therefore then I get my rate of um, reaction, essentially. Okay? Now, the next part of the story is then what we said was that, well, actually, the only way to truly compare um, different conditions, different reactions, is to use the initial rate not just any old rate, yeah? Because you don't want to compare the rate at four minutes for one experiment to the rate at six minutes for a different experiment. We're not comparing like for like. The only way to really compare like for like is to always be comparing the initial rate, okay? So that's how we do it. So what we do is we, we, we take that zero, zero point there and whatever the rate happens to be right at the beginning, so we put the ruler against the line and whatever, whatever that tangent is, we use that as the basis of our triangle. Okay, and again, do the same thing. Divide the change for the triangle. Divide the change in y divided by the change in x. It's the same thing, but it's a, yeah, it's a different shaped triangle because it's the initial rate that you're working out. And so because it's so steep, that's why the triangle is the shape that it is. So you still divide the change in y by the change in Yeah, same rules. Okay, divide the change in, okay, so two, we need uh, a tangent at time zero, the tangent at time zero. And you can draw a big tangent, you can draw a small tangent, doesn't matter. It's the slope of the tangent that's important. Mathematically, the size of your triangle won't affect the slope. Yeah, it's like, you know, the angle is the same. Whether you draw a big triangle or a small triangle, the angle is the same, yeah? 
So that you, we take the tangent at time zero, and then we do the difference, the change in y divided by the change in x. And the, ch the x should usually be a, a change in time. Okay, so the only kind of complication sometimes is that you might have to do a bit of messing around with the units. So sometimes you're given minutes on your graph or you're given seconds on your graph and they, they want you to change it into minutes, which should usually be um, as simple as dividing it by 60 or multiplying it by 60.